I think it's important to talk about chemicals every year in some form or fashion. We've talked about calibrating your sprayer in the past. Different chemicals that we use for switchgrass, for our food plots, for buckwheat, whatever it might be, and, and why, and those differences. But a lot of times, we don't break down the differences of these chemicals between each other, and certainly how to calibrate the sprayer at the same time. It's kind of interesting, you know, we're, we're starting to use more of this UTV sprayer. Um, this is a 45 gallon. It's got seven nozzles here, and there's a lot of different brands. We're not really affiliated with any brand, uh, any particular brand. This happens to be a Femco. My four-wheeler ATV sprayer over there is a Femco. But I like this at seven nozzles, and my ATV sprayer has two nozzles. If you guys see over here, you see it's just a 40-inch boom, two nozzles. Similar nozzles to what are on here for the spray nozzles. <clears throat> What's interesting, that one right there, by being very efficient, by driving seven to eight miles an hour, um, I can use that 25 gallon sprayer and I can spray two acres, pretty definitively. That means I can't overspray too much. When I'm making corners and backing up, I have to turn the sprayer off. And I can be, if I'm very efficient, I can get a full two acres at seven to eight miles an hour, 25 gallon sprayer, been using that kind of combination for about 20 years. You get pretty good at it, but that is that rate. If you think about it, people, ounces per gallon of chemical, throw that out the window. Um, that's a farming term. You can tell when a food plotter is using that that they haven't sprayed a lot because with all the variety of sprayers, from this one right here, 45 gallon with seven nozzles, to that one right there, it's a 25 gallon with two nozzles, and then I've used backpack sprayers before. And when you use all these different types of sprayers, Ounces per gallon means nothing because you don't know what the rate of your sprayer is. All these sprayer rates are different. Basically, the smaller you go and the fewer nozzles, the less efficient you will be. I would, I would estimate that you need about twice as much water to spray over an acre efficiently with a backpack sprayer than you need with the ATV sprayer, let alone this 45 gallon uh, UTV sprayer right here. So you always calculate your coverage rate first at X amount of speed. It doesn't matter if you're putting two quarts out per, of uh, glyphosate, and that's the generic form of Roundup. We'll talk about that one first, but a common amount to put out is two quarts, or to apply is two quarts per acre. So once you figure out how much water it takes to cover an acre, and that could be you're going up to 10 miles an hour, six miles an hour, five miles an hour, you could spray 10 gallons per acre, like we're getting closer to with the UTV, or you can spray 25 gallons of water to get one acre covered like you might with a backpack sprayer because it's so much less efficient. But you have to figure out your coverage rate first and then apply the appropriate amount of chemical. And it doesn't matter, again, if it's going to, you're gonna put out 10 gallons or 25 gallons. If you're gonna go nine, 10 miles an hour, or if you're gonna go five, six miles an hour. You just have to fall within those parameters and that's your kill rate, two quarts per acre. Recommend three quarts per acre of simazine, that's another one. And 2,4-D, I'm only mixing with Roundup, and when I do that, it's one pint per acre of 2,4-D and two quarts per acre of glyphosate, and those are those coverage amounts. And with Clethodim, we're at one pint per acre. Now let's back up for a little bit. You know, the coverage rate, you have to figure out that first, and then add the appropriate amount of chemical. I wanna talk about the differences between these chemicals right here. This first one is glyphosate. And you see that's Mad Dog Plus. The one we bought this year is Buccaneer Plus. It depends on where we get it from, what, what manufacturer they have, but on the label, it is all 41% concentrate of glyphosate. That's the amount you want. Most of the time, these jugs right here, because you're spraying two quarts per acre of glyphosate, each one of these jugs will kill five acres. Look at it that way. This is five acres to kill. That five acres is constant, two quarts per acre. Your coverage rate's gonna vary based on what you have for equipment. So that's why you throw ounces per gallon out the window because what's your coverage rate? You have to figure out that first. Different on large tractors and sprayers and highly metered spraying equipment. But you can see there's all kinds of different names of generic Roundup. They're widely available. They've been approved by the FDA. There's a lot of sham lawsuits out there, but bottom line is when Glyphosate hits soil, and this is why you can't mix soil with these chemicals, but when glyphosate mixes, uh, especially glyphosate, but when glyphosate mixes with soil particles in dirty water, whether it's creek water, uh, pond water, well water's fine. We've used a car wash water, you know, sprayed, opened that up and sprayed our 275 gallon tank. We filled it up with about 150 gallons and we've gone to town from there. 
but uh, that'll work as long as there's not soil in it because as soon as glyphosate hits the ground, it's neutralized. And so if you have soil particles fill, uh, kind of sifting around in those tanks and moving around the water, it's going to neutralize your Roundup and make it ineffective. I know people that have done that the hard way, learned that the hard way, and so let's learn from them. Just, just trust me on that one. Glyphosate is a post-emergent. That means the plant needs to be growing or tree or bush or whatever you're running over and spraying. We sprayed, we ran over a bunch of bushes and trees on our new land and the new food plots from gray dogwood to oak to birch to maple. We ran them over and we got a great kill on those. Uh, gray dogwood. We went right through the clusters of brush, brush and uh, killed them. But they have to be leafed out. That grass needs to be aggressively growing. It needs to be warm enough. You shouldn't be spraying when it's 30 degrees because you want these weeds or trees or bushes, whatever you kill, to be growing rapidly. They have to be leafed out. You can take a fern that's got that head on it. Until that head opens up into an eight inch leaf, you're not going to kill it with glyphosate. It can't absorb that chemical. So that's why glyphosate is a post-emergent, meaning the plants have already emerged, they're already growing. On a decent day, decent growing days, you're going to get a great easy kill in the spring with glyphosate. That is a lot different then the simazine. You can see the simazine right here. And um, simitrol is what they call this one, but it's 42% uh, simazine. With that right there, I'm recommending three quarts per acre. And that is relating to the uh, uh, switchgrass. So we're putting simazine in the spring and we're doing that to kill and set back a, a wide variety of the broadleafs. And then when we follow up with 240 and glyphosate or just glyphosate, just three or four weeks later after spring green up, then there's a highly effective kill in that area with that one-two punch of the pre-emergent of simazine combined with the post-emergent of the 2,4-D and glyphosate or just glyphosate alone after spring green up. So the simazine, it sets back. I've seen people they've used too much and it sets back their switchgrass a long time, keeps it from germinating, let alone other weeds. And so you have to be very careful and make sure you're only using three quarts because simazine, unlike glyphosate, simazine stays in the soil 60 to 90 days. That's powerful. It just hits the soil. It stays in the soil. So if you mix soil water with it, you're probably going to be okay unless you wreck your sprayer. But bottom line is when that hits soil, it stays in the soil. Glyphosate does not. Simazine is a pre-emergent. I only use it for switchgrass. There's really no need to use it for anything else. And even in my easy no-till process where I'm spraying three times and, and planting at the end of the summer, that first spring I complete typically in a brand new field like we did this year with a combination of 2,4-D and Roundup. The 2,4-D immediately kills those broadleafs and they start to wilt up that same day. In the first 24 hours you can notice a difference. And that's the difference with 2,4-D or using 2,4-D in a combination because glyphosate is going to take at least 10 days but probably two weeks to show that you got a good kill with that Roundup and I've seen it take two to three weeks. It's a slow kill. That's the same with clethodim. Clethodim I don't have pictured here or shown. But clethodim is used for eliminating grass in food plots. So we've used that Nebraska planting or clover in the past. So you eliminate those grasses, you kill those grasses. And at that point, um, that is a post-emergent. It cannot stay in the soil and kill that. In fact, when it hits the soil, it's neutralized like Roundup. There's no lingering effect of it um, with clethodim. And again, we're looking at about a pint per acre of clethodim. So clethodim is a post-emergent meaning those grasses have to already be growing. And then glyphosate is a post-emergent, meaning that it has to be growing. And then 2,4-D is a post-emergent, but you can have some residual left with 2,4-D. 2,4-D will stay in the ground about two weeks. And so you really need to plan. If you're planting broadleafs outside of that two-week window with 2,4-D, you could be in big trouble. So that can linger in there. Your buckwheat or your, or your beans, your brassica pops a week later. Well, they're probably going to die. So there's a little bit of a lingering fat. I'm not saying it's a total pre-emergent. Most of the time you're spraying on 2,4-D on weeds that are already growing or broadleafs. But that's where that's a little bit different. So if you look at it, typical amounts, I'm, I'm never spraying 2,4-D without combining it with glyphosate because obviously when I'm trying to spray, I'm trying to kill at that time. Um, some people spray 2,4-D on switchgrass and I found from personal experience, you can kill young plants and injure old switchgrass. And so you have to be very careful. I'd encourage you not to. In fact, I'd encourage you to mow. Usually the end of July, you're hitting that switchgrass at a time when it's really taking exponential growth. So when you set it back, then it grows and outcompetes those weeds around it. You can do that the next year three times. So I'd wait and do it one time 
towards July, August, depending on where you're at in the country, with switchgrass, I'd just mow it down. Or the next year, I'd, I'd uh, mow three times um, in uh, May, June, July, and space it out a month apart to combat those weeds, as opposed to looking at, okay, I'm gonna add 2,4-D, a broadleaf killer, into switchgrass to kill broadleaf weeds, because you really stand a great chance of injuring those unless it's highly metered, very, very efficient, exact spraying. So that's why I'm, when I use 2,4-D, I'm combining one pint per acre of 2,4-D with two quarts per acre of glyphosate, and then I'm using three quarts of simazine, and with clethodim, I'm using one pint, and again, that's a grass killer. Simazine is really the only one that I'm looking at. Okay, I need to spray this ahead of time. I'm looking at pre-spring green up for that initial start for switchgrass. And then I don't want it lingering in the ground for food plots and I might be planting in buckwheat just two months later or two and a half months later and risk injury because there's still simazine in the soil and that broadleaf is starting to grow um, at that time. So I hope that makes sense. We get a lot of questions on chemicals. Um, the calculating your spraying rate is a big one. I have videos out there. If you put calculating ATV sprayer rate, you'll probably find that out there. But it's really important that um, you figure out your coverage rate first based on your equipment, size of equipment, always considering that the fewer no nozzles, the smaller the tank, like a backpack sprayer, you're gonna be the least efficient. And when you get up to more seven nozzles, UTV, 45 gallons, we can get away with, we can put 45 gallons in there and kill a solid uh, four acres. And we're running right around 11, 11 and a, about 11 gallons per acre. And I think I'm not driving it well because I'm putting that outside beam. I you just don't realize how far it's sticking out compared to the booms on the back of the ATV. So I know I doubled up on my spray a lot more. I think I can get that down to about 10, 10 to 10 and a half gallons per acre with a more efficient sprayer like this. And, uh, and then once you figure out those cover rate, coverage rates, again, I'm gonna repeat this because it's this more of a boring you know, chemical talk, but I wanna repeat it that um, glyphosate is a pre-emergent. You're using that two quarts per acre as a general purpose uh, herbicide. Simazine, I'm using three quarts per acre before spring green up for switchgrass. 2,4-D, I'm combining with glyphosate for that first initial kill of a new food plot area where I wanna really kill a lot of bushes, shrubs, weeds and growth and then clethodim's one pint and that's a post-emergent on grasses growing within food plots or other broadleaves and that does work really well to not kill the broadleaves at the same time it's just a specific grass herbicide now all that spraying and talk we do use the plot boost is after your greens are growing so something like this with a wide boom on it and lots of nozzles allows you to keep from smashing a bunch of plots when you're going in and spraying this, this is when you're your crops are already growing, it gives them a boost, it allows them to keep, keep those nutrient levels for a longer period of time. And then plot start. We have a couple of photos this year in this plot, plot start jug, bring this out here. But plot, st plot start right here is an, an alternative to lime. It, once you spray this on the soil, it allows the soil to actually release those nutrients to the plant. And we have some cool photos of this year because we had two test strips, but we have even our weeds growing this year. You can see where we sprayed plot start last year and those weeds are able to grow more because there was more nutrients in the outside of those areas where we actually sprayed, where we didn't spray. There's a clear line right down the middle of our plots where you can see that level of growth for weeds coming into the spring that weren't as established last fall because the plot start was there and that crop actually had a good chance of taking over and shape, shading out those weeds because we had practiced really good weed control. But you can see a difference, a lot lower growth in those strips where we didn't use uh, plot start. And then of course the plot boost from the nutrients. And again, we're going back to, we're figuring out, you know, one of these jugs per acre, but um, we're using that and this is how we use our sprayers. These are the chemicals we use in a given year. And hey, for those of you who don't like chemicals out there, there's a lot of people disking three or four times with big equipment, ripping up the soil, ripping up that top layer, of that top soil. They're exposing the ripped up soil to erosion concerns and they're drying out the soil. And they're using big equipment and fuel to do so. There's always a balance to everything. For me personally, I'd rather conserve the soil, the top soil, use chemicals, use a small amount when needed. That's why I encourage the ultimate no-till where we're rotating buckwheat in, we're eliminating a spring with that, and we're improving the soil, improving the soil with buckwheat, improving the soil with additional tillage radish per acre, 
you can add medium red. So we're always working on soils and we're doing it without ripping up. We're all doing it all no-till and that's why I like these systems. And, uh, and I hope this chemical lesson and video has been fun for you. <laughs> we have a lot more of this um, and a lot more strategy, which is what I like in my new food plot web class that'll be coming out shortly. Keep an eye out for that. We'll announce it on YouTube when it actually comes out. We'll announce it on the website, social media channels, uh, Facebook and Instagram. So make sure you're following us. And we actually have 30 videos of lessons in there. It's about 15 hours of footage, roughly. And uh, that's packed into that web class. And it's a complement to our how to design your whitetail uh, parcel web class. And this will be how to plant food plots. But boy, it goes into about three or four times more when you involve the strategy and the overall strategy for food plots fitting on your land so that they're doing more help than harm. And this is some of the info that's going into that class. You know, of course, a different, uh, more organized uh, video with that. But I hope the jumping around still made some sense and that you can effectively use chemicals and safely more going into the summer.